November 23, 2008, hunters came across the remains of a young woman frozen in a shallow creek in the rural area of Fond du Lac County, Wisconsin. The remains were found on private property near an abandoned farm, partially submerged in the shallow creek on Skyline Drive in Ashford, Wisconsin. Investigators were forced to extract the body by chiseling away the ice, and once removed, scuba divers were brought in to search the bottom for evidence. They found some articles of clothing, including a strapless Zoe Beth brand black and pink top with a pink bow, determined to have come from Family Dollar, where it had been available in the spring of 2008. The underclothing that she wore, also from Family Dollar, was shipped only between July 1st and July 15th, 2008. The victim's socks or shoes were not found at the scene. In the water, investigators found a medal of St. Benedict, but it was not known if it was related to her. Her cause of death was inconclusive, but the manner of death was believed to be a homicide. Although the body was found in late autumn, she had actually died in the summer two to four months earlier. This was established by examining traces from insects that were found on the remains. She had an overbite, and some fillings and dental sealants were found on the upper molars. She was believed to be a Caucasian between 15 and 21 years old, but examiners could not be sure. Other physical characteristics included a healed rib fracture and being pigeon-toed or knock-kneed, which may have been noticeable when she walked as her feet were slanted inward. To obtain DNA information, her femur was transported to the University of Texas. Her DNA was entered into the National DNA Database, and dental records were created that could be compared to those of reported missing persons. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children would have a computer-generated reconstruction created of the victim by using mortuary photographs and a CT scan of the skull that were submitted to the center. The reconstruction of the victim generated over 200 tips but did not produce any solid leads as the composite apparently resembled a large number of missing people. For three years, she remained at the medical examiner's office waiting for investigators to give her a name. In December 2011, her body was laid to rest at Cattaraga Cemetery in a public ceremony and then the case would officially go cold. In April 2018, a revised reconstruction was released and authorities announced that the victim would be exhumed for isotope testing and DNA phenotyping to determine geographical locations where she may have lived and to develop a clear estimation of her ethnicity and physical characteristics. Genetic genealogy would also be used to locate individuals biologically related to her. Bone, tooth, and hair samples were sent to numerous labs throughout the country that specialize in various forms of forensic analysis. Months later, the results indicated that the Jane Doe had likely spent most of her life in the southwestern United States, possibly in Arizona or New Mexico. She had lived in the Midwest, perhaps in southwestern Wisconsin, northern Iowa, or southern Minnesota for less than a year preceding her death. After genealogy research helped identify family members, her DNA was compared to her mother and sister. Her identity was finally announced on November 23, 2021, 13 years to the day that she was found. Amy Marie Yeary was born December 9, 1989, and was originally from Rockford, Illinois. She came from a broken home, and she and her siblings were split up, and Amy went to live with her grandmother in Illinois. About 2015, her siblings were searching for her and started a Facebook page dedicated to finding Amy. She would have been 18 years old when she died in 2008. It was also learned that she spent time in Milwaukee, Chicago, and Beloit, Wisconsin in the weeks preceding her death. While speaking with her mother, detectives learned that Amy had made a phone call to her mother from Beloit in 2008 saying she wanted a ride home. Her mother, who lived in northern Illinois at the time, could not give her a ride due to car trouble. She became angry at her mother and said she was in trouble and then she was never heard from again. A missing persons report was never filed, but the family had hoped to make contact with Amy on their own. She was oftentimes transient and it is believed that she was a victim of human trafficking. 
Although Amy now has her name back, the sheriff's office says there's still work that needs to be done to determine how and why Amy lost her life and ask anyone that knows anything about the case to come forward. At the age of 16, Kim Bryant attended Western High School in Las Vegas, Nevada. On January 26, 1979, she went to the school to register for sophomore classes and then to the Dairy Queen across the street with a friend. While standing outside the restaurant, Kim and her friend were verbally accosted by two young men driving a 1955-57 Chevy with silver primer paint and light spots. Words were exchanged and the men in the Chevy sped off down Decatur Boulevard. The men in the Chevy had also tried to entice other girls from Western High School into their car earlier in the week. Police were able to create a sketch of the passenger who was described as about 18 years old with scraggly blonde hair and the driver was in his early 20s with medium brown hair and possibly had a mustache. At 10 a.m., she would call her boyfriend to come pick her up from the Dairy Queen. By 10.10 10 a.m., Kim's friend had been picked up by her parents. When her boyfriend arrived around 10.45 a.m., Kim was nowhere to be found. Strangely, he would wait four days before reporting this to authorities. At about noon on the day she disappeared, a passing motorist spotted a backpack in the center median on North Decatur Boulevard, which ran between the school and the Dairy Queen. Inside the bag was Kim's ID and belongings. Kim's mother, Sherry Elliott, and stepfather, Edward Elliott, attempted to file a missing persons report when she didn't return home from school that day, but police, who suspected she had run away from home, did not declare her missing until January 31st. This was only after learning her book bag had been found discarded in the median of a nearby roadway. On February 20th, 1979, a month later, her body was found by three young boys in a desert area near West Charleston Boulevard and South Buffalo Drive. She had been sexually assaulted and killed, and DNA evidence from a suspect was recovered, but police were unable to make an identification and the case would go cold. There have been a few theories over the years as to who could have been responsible for her death. Stephen Morin, who was a Vegas serial killer during the time of her murder, was identified as the man that took Kim on a date to a skating rink about two weeks before she disappeared. Also, a macrame belt similar to the one Kim was wearing the day she disappeared was found in a storage unit owned by Morin. And Morin was believed to be responsible for the rape and attempted murder of a 15-year-old Vegas girl in April of 1980, and that girl had been left at the same site where Kim's body was found. However, the head of the Metro Homicide Unit noted that other young women were found murdered in the desert under similar circumstances as Kim after Morin's arrest. Another possible suspect was Bobby Jean Thomas, who was a local Vegas roofer that had been convicted for attempting to assault a woman in 1970. He was convicted of statutory rape and avoided a manslaughter charge as part of a plea deal in relation to the death of his 14-year-old sister-in-law. Thomas was killed the day after Kim went missing. Ronnie Lee Fain, a career criminal from California that recently moved to Vegas, was arrested for his murder. Fain told police he murdered Thomas in a fit of rage after he confessed to the murder of Kim. Fain passed two polygraph exams and his guilty plea was accepted. But Fain later tried to withdraw his confession and some detectives were suspicious of the fact Fain didn't even know Kim's name until he was told it by his defense attorney. And Fain had stabbed another Vegas man to death only a month before the Thomas killing. Most concerning, the detective heading the Thomas investigation said eyewitnesses reported Kim was last seen alive in a vehicle with four men, meaning that even with Thomas's death, three suspects remained on the loose. Then, in 2008, an attempt was made to create a DNA profile from the suspect's semen. Following advances in technology in 2021, DNA from different items of evidence were sent to Othram Incorporated for testing using a financial donation from Las Vegas resident and philanthropist Justin Wu. A male DNA profile was obtained and entered into CODIS, but there were no hits. That's when genetic genealogists built a family tree of the unknown killer, which ultimately led them to Johnny Blake Peterson. 
Othram and police eventually narrowed the search to a relative of Peterson who was willing to give a DNA sample. It was then concluded in November 2021, 42 years after the murder, that Peterson was the person that kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and murdered Kim. Peterson was a 19-year-old Las Vegas resident at the time of Kim's death. He had previously attended the same school as Kim and would have been three years her senior, although it is unclear if they had interacted. He had a 1980 arrest for rape in Las Vegas, but the charges were later dismissed. He was never even on the radar as a suspect for her murder and had died in January 1993. Sadly, Kim's mother, Sherry Elliott, passed away in June of 2020 at the age of 79 before her daughter's killer was named. On December 10, 2020, someone walking near a rest stop in Lincoln County, Oregon, came upon human remains just outside the rest area. When police arrived, they determined that it was a female child concealed inside a duffel bag, then hidden in the forest. It appeared she had been deceased between 30 and 60 days before her discovery and was between the ages of 7 and 9 years old. Investigators and experts at the Oregon State Medical Examiner's Office collected samples from the remains for DNA testing. Parabon Nano Labs extracted the DNA from the samples submitted, and on October 4, 2021, nearly a year later, they notified Oregon State Police that an identification had been made. The deceased was identified as 9-year-old Haley May Koblenz. Haley was born in Colorado and had been living with her biological mother and mother's girlfriend in multiple places in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest since 2015. She was not reported as a missing person at the time of her death, and officials have not given details about the manner of her death. On November 30, 2021, Haley's mother, 29-year-old Shauna Browning, and her mother's girlfriend, 34-year-old Lauren Harrison, were arrested in Detroit, Michigan, and charged with aggravated murder. They are currently being held without bail. It appears that Shauna also has a son that is younger than Haley, and the two have different fathers. It is speculated that she may have lived in and out of hotels on and off for about five years and did not have custody of at least one of her children. This is still an open and active investigation, and both women remain behind bars on aggravated murder charges. To the outside world, it seemed as if Quincy Jamar Davis was a happy, healthy child. He was clean, well-dressed, and did well in school. However, things were different at home because his mom, Tanya Slayton, was very hot-tempered and violent. Tanya had moved from North Carolina to Hampton Roads, Virginia in the early 1990s. She took Quincy with her, but left behind another son, Cameron, who was raised by family in North Carolina. In 1996, she left five-year-old Quincy home alone and was charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor. The next year, she was convicted of misdemeanor assault and battery for striking him with a broom handle, leaving multiple slashes and open wounds. Quincy kept a journal which later revealed details of abuse at his mother's hands. Much of what he endured was unknown to most people during his life and even long after his death. His mother married a Navy man named Ronald Slayton. He later told authorities his ex-wife could fly into a rage and that he had called police to their home in the past. He said he tried to interject on several occasions when she hit Quincy with a belt and baseball bat. Quincy, who had braces, stopped going to the orthodontist in the summer of 2003. He was also withdrawn from school in the fall of that year, before the start of 8th grade, and his mom told the district they were moving overseas. Ronald said he last saw Quincy in July 2004 when he returned from being at sea and was surprised to see Quincy, then 14, and his mom waiting for him at the pier. Tanya offered to give him a ride to his barracks, but when they stopped for gas, she drove off with Quincy and her husband's sea bag. He would file for divorce later that same year. Quincy seemingly vanished after 2004. She told different people different stories about her son over the years. 
In 2008, Tanya was sentenced to serve four years in prison for felony attempted maiming and shooting at an occupied dwelling after firing a gun at her boyfriend during a fight. On June 6, 2015, she was driving east on Interstate 64 in Hampton when state police pulled her over. The state tags were expired and the license plate wasn't registered with the state. During the stop, the trooper spent one hour trying to locate the car's VIN number after Tanya could not provide her registration. They noticed the VIN numbers appeared to have been tampered with and they suspected the car was stolen and possibly sold to her. Because they were unable to establish who the vehicle belonged to, they were required to tow it. However, before the vehicle could be towed, troopers had to take inventory of the vehicle. During the inventory, the trooper discovered black trash bags in the trunk under a spare tire. She allegedly threw some clothes on top of the bag, saying the bag contained just clothes she was planning to donate to a thrift store. However, after getting a search warrant, the troopers found Quincy's body in three plastic bags wrapped in duct tape hidden in the trunk. Investigators also later found Quincy's journal in a box at the Richmond apartment where his mom had most recently been living. Investigators believe she killed Quincy sometime between 2004 and 2005 at the age of 14 or 15. The medical examiner did not give a specific cause of death, but did say it was unnatural. Tanya was scheduled to go to trial for a second-degree murder charge, but instead pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter. The judge then sentenced her to 10 years in prison, the maximum punishment for that conviction, with two years suspended. Sadly, as a side note, Chad Dermeyer, the trooper who found Quincy's body, was shot and killed in the line of duty in 2016. After Quincy's body was found, police interviewed a former boyfriend of Tanya's, and he said he'd never even heard of the child. She had left the Mustang with someone she knew when she went to prison years prior. That person later told investigators he didn't open the car or notice anything unusual about it. As of today, it's still unclear where exactly Quincy's body was being kept all those years, although there were signs of exposure to hot and cold temperatures. On July 21, 1999, a female's bruised body was found at 6.15 a.m. within the first rows of a cornfield by a father and his 16-year-old daughter walking their dogs. The body was located along 92nd Street in a rural area of Racine County, Wisconsin, in the town of Raymond. It appeared she had undergone neglect and abuse, which had increased in the days before her death. She also appeared to have been sexually assaulted and had only been deceased for several hours before being found. Her teeth showed signs of long-term neglect with multiple teeth missing and other showing signs of decay. Her right arm was bent unnaturally behind her and she had multiple obvious injuries. She had a cauliflower deformity on her right ear that may have come from repeated abuse. It was believed that she was possibly cognitively disabled and was believed to be between the age of 18 and 35 years old. When found, she was wearing a man's gray and silver country and western shirt with snap buttons and embroidered with red flowers on the front of the shirt, along with black sweatpants and no shoes. The shirt was produced and distributed throughout the U.S. about 15 years prior in 1984. During the autopsy, it was determined she had endured long-term abuse, was malnourished, and suffered from an untreated infection in her left elbow. Over 50 people attended her funeral on October 27, 1999 in Caledonia, Wisconsin. Her gravestone read, Daughter Jane Doe, along with the dates of discovery and burial, with the phrase, Gone but not forgotten. Multiple reconstructions were created of her face to assist with visual identification of the body. In 2012, a revised reconstruction was created by NamUs, replacing their original. In October 2013, her remains were exhumed for additional testing. At a press conference that same year, police would describe the abuse she endured as barbaric and something none of them would ever forget. It was announced on July 19, 2015, that the examination of her remains had been completed and they would be reburied on the 16th anniversary of her discovery. Authorities stated they had indeed uncovered new leads from the exhumation, but they declined to state any details. 
In 2016, it was announced that the chemical isotope analysis indicated the victim may have spent time in Alaska, Montana, or southern Canada. The police department then planned on seeking forensic genetic genealogy organizations to identify potential relatives of the victim. In November 2019, authorities in Racine County announced that she was successfully identified after two decades. Shockingly, during the conference, they also announced a suspect in her murder. They announced that the remains of the victim belonged to Peggy Lynn Johnson, and the suspect was in custody. The announcement stated that both the victim and the individual in custody have substantial ties to a northwestern Chicago suburb. Peggy was born March 4, 1976, and was 23 years old from McHenry, Illinois. Her accused killer was identified as now 66-year-old nurse Linda Sue LaRoche. LaRoche owned her own nursing practice established in 1997, which provided health care to at least two Illinois correctional facilities without displaying any questionable or inadequate behavior. Her family never reported her missing, although an aunt had placed a personal ad in a December 1999 issue of Northwest Herald requesting Peggy to contact her. However, unbeknownst at the time, her body had been found five months prior. She had never been formally reported as missing, and that is likely because she was living with the woman accused of killing her. Peggy Johnson's name was not known in Racine County. Several of the people who knew her in life didn't know her by that name either. Peggy's mother's name was Diane Schroeder, hence the name Peggy Schroeder. Her father, Scott Johnson, wasn't in the picture and is deceased. Her mother, Diane, had died on November 26, 1994, at the age of 41. She worked at a nursing home and had two kids, Peggy and a son named Jesse, who died in 1998. A neighbor of Peggy's and fellow student of hers at Harvard High School in Harvard, Illinois, named Amanda, recently found out about the discovery and stated that Peggy was the sweetest girl. She never, ever would hurt a fly. She said Peggy fell off the radar in the fall of 1994 when her mother passed away. It appears she went to live with LaRoche following her mother's death as a vulnerable young woman with no one to care for her. Another friend of Peggy's noticed something was amiss around the time but didn't have reason to suspect Peggy had been killed. Nicole was nine when she first met Peggy and visited her once at the LaRoche's soon after Peggy moved into their home in McHenry, Illinois. She said Peggy seemed happy and finally had a job and stability, taking care of LaRoche's kids and home, something she didn't have growing up in a low-income family. She said she tried calling Peggy repeatedly over the next couple years, but never got a call back. So around the summer of 2000, she stopped by the house, and unbeknownst to her, Peggy had already been dead for about a year. LaRoche answered the door and told Nicole that Peggy was a runaway and hadn't been heard from. Nicole and another childhood friend, Kimberly, both remember Peggy as being not all that different from other kids her age. She was a year behind in school and sometimes took a little bit longer to learn something, but was still accepted by many of her peers and had friends to stand up for her when bullies came around. LaRoche was arrested on November 5, 2019 in Cape Coral, Florida. She reportedly confessed to killing someone while living in Illinois to various people, one of whom alerted police in September of 2019. According to a criminal complaint, LaRoche was charged with first-degree intentional homicide and concealment of a corpse. Authorities state the maximum penalty would be life in prison. At the time she was charged with murdering Peggy, she was facing legal proceedings after causing a vehicle accident while intoxicated. Peggy was reportedly last seen by classmates at a 1994 homecoming dance in Harvard, Illinois. The victim and her accused killer first encountered each other in 1994 at a medical clinic where Peggy worked. She became homeless at age 18 after her mother's death as her brother and father were also deceased. The emotional and physical abuse against Peggy took place over a significant period of time before her death, presumably since moving into the home. As indicated by the autopsy, she was subjected to a poor living environment and was not well nourished. Instances of LaRoche's abuse toward Peggy were confirmed by her children, one of which Peggy had confided in after being asked about a bruise to the face. 
Despite friends and classmates of Peggy describing her as mild-mannered and quiet, LaRoche claimed Peggy repeatedly stole from her, including medication, and invited Mills over without permission. The primary witnesses to her alleged abuse of Peggy include her ex-husband and grown children. LaRoche's now ex-husband stated he had come home in July 1999 to find Peggy deceased on the floor and LaRoche claimed it was due to an overdose. LaRoche allegedly claimed Peggy had overdosed on pills and instructed her then-husband to take their children away for an outing so she could dispose of the body. The ex-husband claimed LaRoche left with the body and when she returned two and a half hours later, she no longer had the body. LaRoche claimed that she regained consciousness and she dropped her off at her grandmother's house. Peggy's grandmother denied ever meeting members of the LaRoche family, let alone seeing Peggy on the day in question. And another alleged story she gave her then-husband was that she abandoned Peggy unharmed along a roadway in Wisconsin. Paramedics were not called and LaRoche did not provide medical assistance to her despite being a nurse. However, the autopsy of her body disputed the alleged overdose as toxicology tests were clear. LaRoche first appeared in court on January 9, 2020 for a preliminary hearing. However, the hearing was adjourned due to the fact that LaRoche did not have an attorney. Her trial was set for February 2020 but was postponed until April 2021 so she could get an attorney. However, it was then postponed indefinitely due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In October 2021, the prosecutor said in court that she intends to introduce evidence that would show LaRoche hated Peggy because she believed her husband had an affair with the young nanny. However, her attorney argued without physical evidence, the state would essentially be asking the jury to convict her based on the stories told by her five now adult children and ex-husband. Peggy lived in the LaRoche home from 1994 to the time of her death in 1999. According to the criminal complaint, LaRoche's children recalled that Peggy often had signs of injuries caused by LaRoche, she was forced to sleep in a crawl space under the house, and that LaRoche was verbally and emotionally cruel to her and often screamed at her like an animal. It is unknown if her ex-husband will face any charges for not calling 911. On March 4, 2020, Peggy Lynn Johnson was laid to rest on her birthday next to her mother and grandparents at Highland Garden of Memories in Belvedere, Illinois, with a new headstone bearing her name. LaRoche remains in Racine County Jail, awaiting trial scheduled to begin on February 1, 2022. Although this case is not yet officially solved, Peggy now has her name back in a proper burial, and hopefully her killer will soon face justice.